Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to everyone. I am Dr. Muhammad Salim Ashraf, head of School of Islamic Economics, Banking and Finance, Minhaj University, Lahore. I am the coordinator of the technical session C, the revitalization of Islamic social finance and sustainable development goals. This technical session is being chaired by Dr. Sulman Ahmed Sheikh, Assistant Professor of Financial Economics, Zabist, Karachi, Pakistan. The session will complete in about 60 minutes. Question and answer will be asked via chat box. There is a time constraint for the session. We will try to reply question and answer as many as we can, subject to the availability of the time. The keynote speaker of this technical session is Mr. Ahmad Bakhle, who is an independent expert serving on the analytical support and monitoring team supporting the United Nations Security Council. Now I request Mr. Ahmed Bakhle for his speech. Please, Mr. Ahmed Bakhle. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Salim, and I hope you can uh, see me uh, well and hear me well as well. Your voice is clear, uh, but your background is not clear, so either you can turn it off i will uh, do that yes uh, i apologize for this no no problem um, I'm very saying, uh, you know, up uh, and Maya Jihan Akar Bohat Khoshon. And uh, that is now regrettably the extent of, uh, of my knowledge of Urdu. Uh, I'm sorry if, uh, if, if my grammar or pronunciation was lacking. I, I that sounds spent great. three years in Pakistan. <laughs> Thank you. I spent uh, three years in Pakistan more than a decade ago, and uh, I promised friends that I would return there one day, but never did. So I would like to thank Minhaj University and all my brothers, uh, foremost of whom, of course, uh, Mughith Shaukat and uh, Dr. Salim Ashraf, Dr. Salman Ahmed Sheikh, of course, for allowing me this opportunity to return to Pakistan, at least uh, virtually and uh, in spirit. Um, if, if you'll allow me, I, I want to remember my first teacher of Urdu who was a, a scholar who had translated our Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize laureate Najib Mahfouz from Arabic. Uh, such was his passion about uh, cross-cultural exchanges that he believed every Pakistani should know a little Arabic, which they did, and every Arab should know a little Urdu, uh, which they unfortunately don't. Uh, I think I was one of his failed projects during the time I spent in Pakistan. Uh, my teacher was also the one who warned me of taking too much comfort in the Islamabad bubble always telling me that, um, you know, Islamabad is 20 minutes away from Pakistan. So I heeded his advice and ventured as much as I could, you know, from, from, the, from the breathtaking plains of Skardu to the euphoric hustle of uh, shopping at the Kisakhwani Bazaar and, you know, from peaceful hikes in Natya Gali to uplifting company of a Kowali recital in Multan. I learned from these excursions. I learned from these experiences that Pakistan is truly Asia's best kept secret. And uh, I became a preacher of the country's potential and the country's grace. It, it wasn't all, all fun and roses during my time there, I must say. It was a time of a significant uh, political transition and uh, violence, but Pakistan turned the corner and children who were not yet born at the time or who were too young to remember that period are now the ones who are getting into university, and it is for them, as Marith, as Marith mentioned in, in the previous session, that we must keep on building, keep on improving, and aiming to hit uh, peak potential. And I believe Pakistan has all the potential of being a magnet for investment. Uh, natural beauty, strategic location, hospitable people, negligible language barrier, affordable, well-educated, youthful labor, and in that regard, it shares similarities with my own country and with others represented in this auspicious conference. Wherein then lie the barriers to progression? You know, is it political will, international perceptions, marred in stereotypes? It is, is it stagnant social mobility? I do not know. 
but I'm not here to harp on ailments or past opportunities lost. I don't have that authority. And I do that enough when I speak about my own country, because like so many of my Pakistani friends I met over the years, I too, when talking about my own home, I'm sometimes prone to self-flagellation and the self of uh, crippling fatalism about the future. But I, I resolve to be less of that uh, glum person because I don't think we have the luxury of uh, lethargy that comes with the self-righteous wagging of fingers. So let's always focus on the way forward and about what we can bring to the table, about synergies, as uh, Brother uh, Maurice would say, you know, synergies that can lead somewhere rather than recriminations that lead to nowhere. And, and speaking of these synergies, I don't think this conference could have come at a more opportune time. In the beginning of what is hopefully going to be the year of recovery, the year we turn the crisis of the pandemic on its head and transform it into an opportunity. Because every challenge, as we know, every crisis is an opportunity to learn, to grow, to innovate, and to come out stronger at the end of the tunnel. So what has this crisis taught us so far? Well, first is that every economy is prone to dramatic and instant downturns in the face of unpredictable health environment or environmental crises, or in the face of uh, remote crises that happen elsewhere in the world. Also, it has shown that those who were able to weather the storm of this current crisis were the ones who were able to quickly transpose their services, their value onto the virtual space. Uh, a, sh a short time ago, we used to talk about the internet and digitization as enablers uh, for quicker or more inclusive growth. Now we talk about digitization not as an enhancer, but as an existential imperative. The pandemic also exposed us to, you know, exposed to an even greater extent the inequity of technological advancement, not only between countries and each other, but between uh, but within each society, you know, and, and, and bridging these gaps is particularly important. Uh, one of the lessons of the pandemic, at least for me, was that the connectivity uh, in terms of um, internet penetration, mobile phone usage, and other outmoded indicators of technological development that our countries were lauded for are not sufficient indicators anymore for preparedness in, in a crisis-ridden digital future. I, I, uh, I remember a recent study by Google showed that for 16 emerging markets, many of them represented in this conference, including Egypt, while internet connectivity grew almost fourfold in the previous decade, cumulative GDP for those countries was only 7%. So while policy prescriptions used to focus on capital investment and attracting FDIs and broadband and mobile services, there was apparently something missing in order to truly reap the benefits of digitization uh, to our emerging markets. Yes, investment in physical infrastructure is important, but there are three other elements that are crucial to our forward outlook. Investment in human capital, and this was, uh, I believe, Roberto Croci's focus in the previous session. Technological innovation and sound regulatory frameworks, which was the crux of, of Mohammed Khatib's attention in the last session. In terms of human capital, we are talking about raising the digital skills and literacy of large segments of the population, but also encouraging entrepreneurship, instilling policies and systems that foster financial inclusion and bring affordable and convenient credit and banking solutions to as many people as possible. In terms of technological innovation, we refer to issues such as the promotion of data sciences and funding and possible uses of AI and machine learning. I, I personally work on compliance in banking and new technologies. And I am fascinated by how the reg tech industry, for example, is sprinting towards technological solutions that are making banking easier and yet still secure in a way that opens the door for more financial inclusion, but closes the window to malicious actors who dwell in the dark corners of illicit activity, money laundering, and terrorism finance. The last of these important elements for success is the comprehensive uh, regulatory framework. Uh, you know, one that is rooted in protecting consumers and promoting competitiveness, encouraging innovation and facilitating rapid but safe adoption of new solutions. If, if this policy concoction is promoted to serve large corporations with a heartless bottom line, then it has missed the mark because the true mission of digital transformation 
is to preserve and upgrade and achieve the appreciation of our human capital. So when we speak of, of the opportunities of the low hanging fruits, they are, we are not speaking of them for financial institutions as much as for the people who make up our civic institutions. When we speak of financial inclusion, it is not to promote banks, but to promote banking as a utility for growth and empowerment. And so today I'm thrilled to be on this panel where some papers will, uh, will focus on the essence of that journey of digitalization and inclusion, whether it's to enhance, uh, enhance uh, health services in, in sisterly Mauritania or to help achieve sustainable development goals. Other papers uh, will reflect on the essence of some of the policies I mentioned earlier. So we might hear something about the constitutionally entrenched regulatory framework in Indonesia that empowers innovation and uh, more popular financial solutions. And maybe we will hear something about capitalizing on challenges and turning them into harbingers of growth in areas uh, such as Islamic business models and risk management. Finally, uh, if I just go back to the four baskets of policies necessary for a socially conscious digital transformation, so investment in physical capital, human capital, technological innovation, and regulatory frameworks, None of these elements can be and efficient without a strong, sustained, and symbiotic relationship between the private and academia. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I will. I, I am coming to my end. The role of um, the role of, of representative government is is to make sure that laws and regulations are promulgated, but it cannot do so without evidence-based research provided by academia and without the positive feedback loop and consultation processes that are provided by the private sector. Uh, investments, yes, are required in physical and human capital, but they cannot be done without substantial inputs from the private sector. And if we are talking about a comprehensive societal digital transformation, then it is crucial that financial institutions carry the weight in expanding credit, credit opportunities, investing in accelerators, you know, training, uh, providing trainings and fellowship programs in, in close collaboration with students. That I think is, is the beauty and the precious added value of this conference in that it is a true embodiment of this uh, iron triangle of cooperation between the public, the private and the uh, pedagogical. Um, I have gone on for some time and I apologize that I have kept you waiting for the real substance of this panel. Uh, so thank you all for your time, and uh, Dr. Salman, back to you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ahmed Bakle, for your expert views. Uh, four papers are being presented in this technical session. I request Mr. Hani Adhani, from International Islamic University of Malaysia for his research presentation. Mr. Hani Adhani. Okay, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much. Uh, I will share my uh, PowerPoint. Can you open the Okay, my, my title uh, paper is, sorry, is the Constitutional Court of the Republic of Indonesia, Guardian of Islamic Social Finance. Uh, my name is Hani Adhani. I am PhD candidate from International Islamic University of Malaysia and also deputy registrar in Constitutional Court of the Republic of Indonesia since 2003. So uh, I will start from the Indonesian profile. As you see that Indonesia have a population about two, uh, 260 million, and the religion is 85% is Muslim, 9.8 Christian, and 3.13 is Buddhist, Hinduism, and Confucian. And we have uh, 70,000 islands. Our capital city is Jakarta. We have also famous city just like Bali, Lombok, Bandung, Jakarta. Our country is Rufia. Our number of ethnic is 130, uh, 1,340, and our state motto is University. Unity in diversity and our independence is 
August 17, 1945. This is an Indonesian map. Total area is uh, 1,905 million kilometers. So we will start from the story of amendment of Indonesia Constitution. Indonesia Constitution, or in, in Bahasa Indonesia, is called Undang-Undang Dasar 1945. In the era of Suharto, President of Suharto became a tool for status quo because there is no limitation of the president power. Suharto, uh, President Suharto, stayed in, in his office for 33 years and became corrupt and authoritarian. In May 1998, because of the economy of Indonesia collapsed and all of the people and students make some demonstration, Suharto finally resigned from his office and automatically, automatically the, the vice president, P.J. Habibis, became president. And the Habibi agenda is only the preferred general election in 1999. The election in 1910 is becoming the first free and fair election after the era of Suharto. So we choose a new member of Congress from the result of the general election 1910, have, and they have a job to amend the initial constitution. So the process of amendment is start in 1999 until 2002. So from the amendment, finally, we have the new institution. One of the new institutions is Constitutional Court of Premier Indonesia. The Constitutional Court of Republic Indonesia is stated in Article 25C in Indonesia Constitution. Uh, the court has a task, first is to review law against the Constitution and then uh, uh, de determining disputes over the authority of state institution whose power are given by this Constitution, deciding over dissolution of political party, deciding dispute over the ratio of general election and impeachment of president. So we also can call the, the Constitutional Court is the guardian of constitution, the final interpreter of the constitution, the guardian of democracy, the protector of citizen of personal rights, and also the protector of human rights. So uh, in the Constitutional Court law, the arrangement for cons constitutional judge are uh, mentioned in, in, in chapter 15. So constitutional judge, so comply with the following condition. First is have integrity and personality beyond reproach, fair. And then the state men who control the constitution and state administration, and also being obedient to God Almighty or taqwa and having noble character. All we can say in Bahasa is ahlakul, ahlak mulia. So the word morality is the plural of the word of huluk, or we can say is character, moral, or in Indonesia we call ahlak. So Article 15, Paragraph 2 explains that what is meant by being obedient to God Almighty is mean is, is carrying out religious teaching. But unfortunately, it's no explanation about noble moral or ahlakul mulia or ahlakul karima. So we can conclude that noble moral are like the moral of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. So from this description, we conclude that someone who elected become constitutional judge will definitely have noble moral and will not possibility commit disgraceful act. The noble character is the initial capital for constitutional, ju constitutional judge to maintain Islamic value, which will later become one of the constitutional issue discussed and resolved in every case submitted by the court. This is the table about how many cases come to our court related to the issue of the Islamic uh, economic value. So the, at least there's two decisions and become landmark about the issue of uh, social Islamic value. First is case number 93, concerning judicial review law number 21, concerning Sariah banking, Sariah banking law. So the, the court gives some decision and guideline According to the Constitutional Court, the choice of legal forum as stipulated in the Article 55, paragraph 2 of the Sariah Banking Law in several concrete cases has open space for settlement forum. It also creates constitutional issue that can lead to legal uncertainty that can cause customer loses their constitutional right. The court also mentioned that there is a choice choice of dispute resolution or choice of forum to resolve dispute in Sharia banking as referred in Article 55, paragraph 2 of the Sharia banking law, it will auto automatically lead 
to offer living power to judge because two court are given the authority to resolve Sharia banking this dispute because in Indonesia we have a general court and also a religion court. So the court also said that simultaneously in the religious court law, it is explicitly state that religious court are given the power to resolve Sharia banking dispute, including Islamic economic dispute. Another case who become landmark uh, related to the issue of Islamic value is case number eight, 2019, concerning Halal Product Guarantee Act. According to the court, it is necessary to realize that halal products are limited to Muslim community. Therefore, it is impossible to impose, to enforce a limitation that the halal product guarantee law only apply to Muslim community. This provision also prevent that the non-Muslim community from obtaining good or product that use element that are not halal. The court also said that the halal product law in Esmond does not prohibit business actor from product pro, from production on halal product as long as they product are make as not halal. The court also mentioned that the law does not adhere to mandatory halal but attached to mandatory halal certification, which is followed by halal labeling process. It means that the halal product must include the halal logo by the halal product guarantee law. And the conclusion of the court, anyone, anyone who will consume or use product products no longer need to feel doubtful, worry, or afraid because it will be clear which products are guaranteed to be halal and which products are not halal according to the label of the halal. So my conclusion is, in its development, the court, the constitutional court as the guardian and interpreter of the constitutional the constitution also take part in effort to safeguard Islamic social and economic value based on Article 33 of Indonesia Constitution, which regulated the national economy. The Islamic economic value that already exists and is root in Indonesia society must always be guarded by nine uh, constitutional judge. The selection of constitutional judge who have noble moral or ahlakul karima is one of the primary key. The elected constitutional judge can consistently maintain the, maintain the existing Islamic value root in the Indonesia pe people's soul. Hopefully, the constitutional court can continue to, consist, to consistently maintain Islamic social economic value through its various decision to help and support Indonesia Islamic economic value. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hani Adhani, for sharing your research idea. Now I request Ms. Vatimutu Mukhtar Madhu from International Islamic University, Malaysia, for her research presentation. Please, Ms. Fatima Tomo, Mukhtar Malouf. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi Can you hear me? Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me? Walaikum assalam, Ms. Vatimadu Mukhtar Malouf. Can you listen to me? Uh, okay, I'm not able to turn on my camera. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. First of all, I would like to thank the uh, University of Minhaj for giving us this opportunity to present our research. Uh, I'm going to present my paper entitled The Impact of Using Islamic Microfinance Products on the Healthcare in Mauritania, Evidence from Nouakchott. Nouakchott is the capital city of Mauritania. The presentation is organized as follows. Um, as we all know that poverty is a persistent problem that has been existing for so many years and till now, uh, it, despite all the strategies to alleviate it, it's still increasing in some part uh, of uh, African countries. Uh, the latest uh, 
uh, estimation of World Bank mentioned that in by 2030, the poverty in Africa will be around 90% in sub-Saharan African countries. This uh, situation um, threatens Mauritania most because Mauritania has a fragile uh, economy system where most people like living under poverty. It is among the poorest uh, African countries of the sub-Saharan region. Uh, around 30% 30, uh, 30 of people are living under relative poverty and 16% uh, of them are living under uh, severe poverty, which means under $1.9 per day. Also, the financial ex exclusion is another main problem in Mauritania. Around 80% of people do not have any uh, formal accounts, so they are completely excluded from the financial system. Even though uh, Mauritania is 100% Muslim countries and we have Islamic microfinance and Islamic finance, but people still um, not using them due to some barriers. Uh, anyway, this um, study uh, proposed Islamic microfinance because it has not been used as a solution to alleviate poverty in Mauritania yet. Uh, there are, um, based on the literature review, uh, there are some gaps, uh, first of all, about the uh, divergency of results. There are some mixed results about the effectiveness of Islamic microfinance uh, on poverty, because um, some people say it impacts poverty, others say it does not impact. Also, in the uh, geographical context, there is a great contribution because we have a scarcity of studies in uh, the context of Mauritania. As we all know that the poverty uh, is a multidimensional concept that has several dimensions. So by elevating poverty, we need to focus on each item individually, uh, each uh, dimension. Uh, this study focuses on one dimension of poverty, which is the health care. There are other dimensions, such as education, income, and all. Also, one dimension of financial inclusion that, uh, that has been um, not yet um, widely uh, research, um, discussed in the literature is the usage. Some people like have confusion between access and usage. Some people, uh, like in Mauritania, we have access, but the, the people do not use. The problem is not mainly access. The research objective of this study is to determine the impact of uh, Islamic microfinance product on Mauritanian healthcare. This is the framework. Uh, we have only one of uh, hypothesis. Um, based on the literature, also there are um, some different mixed results, um, but uh, we are supposing a hypothesis that the usage of Islamic microfinance has a significant effect on uh, healthcare in Mauritania. The philosophy of the study is positive. This is a quantitative study uh, the, using deductive method. Uh, the, uh, the method of collection is purposive something because we are targeting only one uh, largest institution of Mauritania, which is Procapic. This was the first and uh, the largest uh, micro, Islamic microfinance institution in the country, which has more than 18 branches in the capital city in Waqshaw. The method of analysis is structural equation modeling. Actually, um, the main purpose of choosing this um, Islamic microfinance institution because it is the only institu Islamic institution that has a um, uh, broad uh, outreach in the country. Uh, we are using the software uh, SPSS and AMOS for the structure equation modeling. Uh, we, uh, the dependent variable here is uh, for a five linker scale uh, based on literature like the items has been adopted from the previous studies based on the investing on health care, how people they invest on their health. For the independent variable is the usage of Islamic microfinance products available only in that institution. We have only four um, uh, products, uh, micro murabiha, qard hassan, saving and micro remittances. Uh, the items are based on the frequency of using those products based on the uh, reliability using SPSS, the Kronbach Alpha is greater than 0 0.7, which shows that the items are reliable. This is a structure equation modeling. The model is valid because all the indices are above the CAT score. Uh, here, the result of the hypothesis. Uh, the hypothesis is not significant, which means that, like uh, the usage of Islamic microfinance did not impact the healthcare in Mauritania uh, uh, because we have the p-value greater than 0 0.05. Uh, this is, can be explained by 
and the lack of awareness among Mauritanians on investing on their health. Or maybe the funds gotten from Islamic microfinance uh, are, uh, are invested in other economical activities more than uh, their own health. This uh, result is supported by different studies, such as uh, Rahman, which has conducted the same, almost the same study, but in a different contexts in Pakistan. Uh, also, this result can be explained by the respondent nature. Maybe uh, the nature of respondent are people who are covered already. They have uh, hair, like health insurance from the government. Uh, recommendation. It is highly recommended that um, uh, the gov Mauritanian government adopt strategies that alleviate the barriers to usage of Islamic microfinance. Because once people start to use Islamic microfinance, and their poverty level will be reduced since all Mauritanians are Muslims and they are skeptical to um, conventional institutions. So by this, I end my presentation and thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Ms. Wakim Uzum Mukhtar Maloud for sharing your research idea. Now I request Muhammad Sirajul Huda Khan, Center of Research Excellence in Islamic Banking and Finance. King Fahad University of Petroleum and Minerals, Saudi Arabia, for his research presentation. Please, Ms. Muhammad Sirajul Huda Khan. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim uh, Can you all hear me? Can you hear me, please? Yes. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Just uh, how to make it bigger one? Yes, Muhammad Islam. Okay. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As we are. Uh, participating here with different parts of the world. <clears throat> Please can I begin by thanking Minhaj University for this initiative to invite us to present this paper. And it is with great honor that I'll be presenting this paper with Honorable Dr. Abul Hassan, who is an associate professor at King Fahad University of Petroleum and Sciences. Uh, myself, I actually, I want to just correct, I am a faculty at Prince Mohammed bin Fahad University, based in the Eastern province of Saudi Arabia. Besides, it's an honor for me to speak to this uh, unique uh, audience. Uh, I'll just begin, oh my God, where is my presentation? Excuse me, I'm sorry, I cannot. Yeah. All right. Uh, um, as you see, the title of our presentation is Islamic Banking uh, Business Models After COVID-19, Taking Standard Risk Management to the Next Level. And uh, I'm co-presenting with Dr. Hassan, as I mentioned earlier. So I'll quickly go through the contents. Uh, first of all, I'll be able to introduce uh, the topic. Then I'll touch the Islamic banking in COVID-19 pandemic. Um, uh, you know, issues. Then I'll be touching the literature review. Uh, and then I'll be focusing on methodology of the study. Um, besides, I'll also talk about the COVID-19 risk and uh, business model and reaction of Islamic banks. And furthermore, I'll be talking about the standard risk management strategies, phase one and phase two. And then I will be able to conclude, inshallah. After my presentation, Dr. Hassan uh, will join me and he'll be able to answer the questions. So introduction, uh, as we all know that, that all the Slavic banks uh, emerged relatively unheard from the 2018 global financial crisis. But COVID-19 pandemic has a deeper impact 
resulting shocks to both supply and demand, and that's matched to pre-existing conditions in the global macroeconomy. The COVID-19 pandemic crisis has triggered an extraordinary challenge across all sectors of economy, impacting banking functions, particularly risk management and managing the risk should be the most important immediate priority for an Islamic bank. Uh, Islamic banking and COVID-19. Since the inspection of the Islamic banking and finance industry in the 1970s, there has been a steady growth in demand for Sharia compliant products and services. The industry's total assets reached to a high of 2.5 trillion US dollars globally in 2019, as for IFSB 2020. But given the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, the volatility in oil prices and the uncertain, uncertain macroeconomic environment, the Islamic banking and financial finance industry faces unprecedented challenges to its development and coming months and perhaps even expanding to next few years. So the coronavirus and Islamic bank. So due to corona, uh, uh, Islamic banking models flaw actually. Capital profit and loss and liquidity positions have been hit very hard. Uh, every industry has been affected and Islamic banking is certainly no exception. One consequence has been that Islamic banks models have broken down across their businesses. These flaws have put the reliability of Islamic banking models doubt uh, in doubt and suggest that they cannot be trusted to help Islamic banks navigate through the crisis. So I'll be discussing the end of the paper. It is a fact that the COVID-19 pandemic has put forth the challenges of unexpected flaws in the business models that Islamic banks rely upon. The aim of this paper is to explain how to move to a crisis operating mode, uh, crisis operating mode for standard risk management, as well as moving to the next level of the standard risk management journey for Islamic banks. Uh, I'd like to just uh, touch uh, on the literature review uh, with regards to business models. In general, we find three models in the Islamic banking system. Orhan 2018, commercial banking. Model one, participatory modes like Modaraba and Musharaka. Model two, fixed rate, rate uh, instruments. Investment banking. This is profit and loss sharing, PLS, based on medium long-term funds. Universal banking. Commercial plus investment banking plus limited participation in real trade. Uh, the literature review continues. Studies related to business model of Islamic banks are rare. In one of them, Fahimi and others, 2006. In 2006, uh, are analyzing, uh, analyzing the fee income activities of two full-fledged Islamic banks and 16 Islamic banking window schemes offered by conventional banks from 1994 to 2004 in Malaysia. In a study back and others in 2013, uh, compare the business model as well as efficiency and stability of Islamic banks versus conventional banks. In result of their analysis, including 88 Islamic banks and 40 422 conventional banks from 22 countries. They find Islamic banks are less cost effective, better capitalized, and have a higher intermediation ratio and asset quality. Uh, now the method methodology. Since this, since this study is a conceptual type of research, so conceptual research is defined itself as a methodology. No particular methodology is followed. 
wherein research is conducted by mm -hmm. observing and analyzing and analyzing and already present information. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, I'll be discussing reasons for Islamic banking model failures. Firstly, model assumptions and boundaries defined at the design stage were developed in a pre-COVID-19 world. Secondly, most draw on historical data without the access to high frequency data that would enable recalibration. And lastly, while access to the needed alternative data is theoretically possible, uh, theoretical, theoretically possible, models would not be able to integrate the new information in an nimble manner because the system and infrastructures on which they are built lack the necessity, necessary flexibility. The Islamic Bank's reaction now to COVID-19 crisis triggered new risk. Islamic banking sectors were unprepared for our lockdown economy and have scrambled to adjust. Rapidly, they took model mitigation actions, often in an uncoordinated way, rushed the following four type of actions. The list goes, one, replacing models with expert views only, recalibrating models using recent data, adjusting model outcomes according to expert analysis, building alternative models to fit banks' current needs, banks' current needs. Furthermore, Slavic banks' uh, reaction to COVID-19 crisis strict new risks. The mitigation actions themselves are generating a host of new risk as per the information blow. Model failures, contradictory message and decisions inability to launch effective redevelopment. Islamic banks need to do more than act efficiently in the short term to manage the crisis. Moreover, I'd like to discuss about the strategies. What strategies should IFIs now be putting in place? In order to address the challenges thrown up by COVID-19 and the risk of quick fix solutions, Islamic banks should develop their two phase strategy. The first phase is a short term crisis operating mode for standard risk management, SRM. The detail is below. Inventory of model adjustments and model at risk consistent mode mitigation actions, timely review of model adjustments, short and long-term redevelopment plans. The second phase is long, longer term, comprehensive enhancement of the SRM strategy to increase resilience and enable proactive adjustment to arising changes. The details are to follow. Overview of models at risk and model con contagion. Model contingency plan, dynamic SRM dashboard, flexible and versatile talent pool. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this time now I'd like to conclude. So to conclude, the COVID-19 pandemic has been discussed, which has caused a terrible change in human lifetime and in the livings of millions the world over. COVID-19 pandemic has put forth, put forth the challenges of unexpected flaws in the business models of Islamic banks rely upon. We have explained in the paper how to move to a crisis operating more for standard risk management, as well as moving to the next level of the standard risk management journey for Islamic banks. Yeah. The implication of the Islamic banks uh, uh, 
Okay, it's just one minute only. The implication of Islamic banks of developing a detailed, timely uh, understanding of the financial performance of uh, customers are far-reaching. Lastly, from the from the perspective of the of standard risk management SRM, banks will be able to make more Thank informed, you. speedier yeah. credit under traction. Thank you very much. Thank, you, Thank you very much for your attention. And Dr. Hassan will be able to take question if required. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Muhammad Siraj al Khan, for sharing your research ideas. Uh, once again, thank you very much. Now, uh, I request Mr. Rabiul Alam, Faculty of Education, University of Malaya, Malaysia, for his research presentation. Please, Mr. Rabiul Alam, we are uh, running out of time. Please take only five to six minutes to complete your presentation. I will be very grateful and thankful to you, Mr. Rabiul Alam. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Please proceed. Okay. Honorable chair of the session, uh, keynote speaker, and the session coordinator, participants, and the respected presenters. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. This is Rubil Alam from the University of Malaya. Today, I'm very much honored to be here in the hub of scholars to present our paper. And I, oh, uh, I just show my uh, heartfelt gratitude to our other authors, especially Professor Dr. M. Kabir Hassan. So our, uh, our presentation is about, OK, reinvigorating the contributions of Islamic social finance in attaining the SDGs. A review. Actually, this is a review paper. Okay, uh, I'm just talking about the introduction. Islamic social finance includes Jakarta, Wakfa, Sadaka, and Qad al -Husana. All these phases of Islamic social finance have an independent mission or motto that is to bring happiness and harmony in the society ensure social and financial security, wipe out poverty, remove hunger, and ultimately ensures an integrated development in the living standard of overall human being of the world. So uh, uh, the necessity of Islamic finance became very much visible and vibrant after the GFC, uh, uh, the revitalization and undeniable importance of Islamic finance and financial institutions came to gain an inclusive attention of the scholars since Islamic finance and Islamic financial institutions were mostly able to ensure their stability and regain the loss during the crisis, as Islamic finance has the power to surmount any crisis. Both Islamic social finance and the SDGs are tied closely with each other, having a good bond, and they are comparable with each other too. They have the same intention as they strive to bring welfare for the community, and they are investing their unstoppable efforts to achieve such noble goals. Islamic social finance is a socially responsible financial system that fulfills the Makassid al Sharia and eventually help contributing to the achievement of the SDGs. 
United Nations Assistant Secretary General Safina Lalani in 2019 mentioned that Islamic social finance has a great potential to help government and communities meet the national development targets. Such bonding between the SDGs and Islamic social finance has warranted the existence of this paper, since this paper intends to see how the revitalization or the proper implementation of Islamic social finance helps the attainment of the SDGs. The, uh, actually, uh, why we have motivated to do such a study? The current scenario of the world has the current scenario of the world has heightened the demand of such study more intensely since the COVID-19 has almost halted and slowed down the entire economy of the globe. And people are in untold economic hardship. And to overcome this sort of economic hardship, we see that many kinds of conventional uh, financial institutions have come forward to help them. Uh, so that's why this is the prime motivation of this study as it aims to evaluate the existing studies pertinent into sources of Islamic social finance to terminate or minimize people's majorities in, the, in this global pandemic. Based on the previous evidence that was documented during and after the GFC, where Islamic finance took the lead role against its counterpart conventional finance in regaining and of bringing the collapsed economy. Considering the previous example, this study hopes that revitalization of Islamic social finance will surely benefit the COVID affected people and subsequently helps to attain the SDGs as Islamic finance becomes zero, zero tolerance with interest for any harmful acts. Excuse me, Mr. Rabiul Alam. Yeah. We are running short of time. Please uh, take only three minutes more, please. Okay. 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 You. okay. Thank you. Thank you. So the main purpose of this study is to investigate how the source Islamic social finance can provide viable solutions to combat this uncertainty and establish a more economically balanced and just society, which is also the aim of the SDGs. So uh, I'm just turning to methodology. This study has gone through an extensive literature review of the existing and pertinent studies on social finance and Islamic social finance to identify the present context, their contribution to the SDGs, limitations, and gaps in the theory and practice. Stan's review of literature helps to understand the prevailing gaps between the theories and current practices on the ground when it comes to SDGs achievement. So uh, now I'd like to draw the attention of Islamic social finance and the SDGs. What is the link between them? Islamic finance industry has experienced a progressive growth in many Muslim and non-Muslim countries across the world, and the annual growth rate of Islamic finance asset is almost 12.7 percent, equivalent to a total asset of 1.27 billion USD. So among the uh, Islamic finance, we uh, uh, as we have discussed that zakat is the is one of the most influential basic pillars of Islam and the prime source of Islamic economy. The main aim of Jakarta, you all know that. But how it is related? As DC1, you see that that is no poverty, as DC2, no hunger, as DC3, no uh, uh, is ensuring good health, as DC10, that is reducing inequality or establishing equality, as DC11, that is ensuring sustainable cities or communities. So all these things are uh, intrinsically related with the zakat because zakat's aims is also to ensure the equality in the society and just bring harmony in the society. Establishment of brother, zakat. Brother, element. please conclude. Please conclude, uh, brother. Please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the second vital Islamic social finance is wakwe. We all know that wakwe is for the betterment of the society. It is given to those people who are in debt without uh, framing any time uh, time frame to repay. And then uh, we also uh, know about Sadaka and the uh, other, uh, I mean, Qart al -Hassana. These are also uh, uh, other uh, sources of Islamic social finance. So now I'm just talking about the constraints of the Islamic social finance. You see, this is a model, current context, economic crisis, debt trap, poverty, environmental changes problems. Unemployment problems, several social problems, limitation of public spending. Then uh, it goes to demand for social impact or social Islamic social finance. 
then what are the challenges i have hopefully you had problem of governance model limitation so, of your social health thank you mr rabiul alam thank okay, you thank rabiul, you mr. thank rabiul. you so much for your patience thank you so much yeah Thank you, Mr. Rabi Alam, for sharing your ideas. Once again, thank you. Now, I request session chair, Dr. Salman Ahmed Sheikh, to give his expert views and conclude the session. Please, Mr. Salman Ahmed Sheikh, be precise and uh, give the views in a precisely manner. We have uh, very limited time. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for uh, providing this opportunity to share my comments in this uh, August conference. Uh, we have had uh, a keynote speech by Mr. Ahmed Bakli, and then uh, four research papers have been presented. So just to summarize what we have discussed in this uh, uh, session and also giving some suggestions to the uh, respected uh, uh, paper presenters. Uh, so we started with the keynote speech. There were some very important ideas discussed by Mr. Ahmed Bakli. Uh, digitization in this uh, post COVID-19 scenario is not a choice, <laughs> but now it is a condition of survival. Uh, he discussed uh, this uh, uh, very well. And then uh, he also pointed out that um, uh, in dealing with COVID-19 situation, the regulators have to have a swift policy response. And that is very essential in a crisis-like situation. He also said that regulation is important for safety and stability in the financial system, but it does not need to stifle entrepreneurship and the technical innovation, which is also very necessary. So technical innovation holds key. And then he also pointed out that uh, we have to have a very strong coordination between the public and private and the academia. And he said that uh, pedagogy, public and private partnership is very important. And then uh, we have had uh, four paper presenters. Uh, first paper was uh, in the context of Indonesia. And uh, in that paper, it was highlighted that political will and regulatory framework is very important to, uh, to the growth of uh, new industries like Islamic finance, uh, uh, in Indonesia, the Muslim population is quite huge, but uh, Islamic finance market share was not quite uh, uh, significant in the earlier era. But now with the change in political administration, we have now 10% market share of Islamic uh, banking and finance in the uh, Indonesian uh, financial industry. And that is a very good development. Uh, one suggestion uh, to the paper presenter is that if you add some statistics from IFSB data, the data is available on the banking as well as the Kaful sector, that would also uh, enhance the quality of the paper once you go for uh, publishing of that paper. So extend the scope of research to include more things. You have uh, talked about halal industry, but you can also include other uh, institutions and subsectors of Islamic finance because your paper was a review paper. So it would be very nice if you can uh, blend it with, uh, with a better coverage of all the financial subsectors. The paper on Mauritania was very uh, uh, interesting. It was an empirical study. It um, uh, tested a model. Uh, I would recommend that if you can include more control variables um, besides the one that you have included, uh, that would also benefit uh, uh, your uh, 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 your findings and it will give uh, robustness to your findings if you include more control variables, especially from the uh, demographic characteristics. Uh, you have highlighted the role of healthcare, which is very important. Non-financial support in Islamic microfinance is very important besides the financial support and healthcare is very important, has been highlighted by uh, World Bank and Asian Development Bank that uh, uh, if you have a healthy workforce, that would also be a more productive uh, workforce. So Islamic social finance is very important in that context. Waqf and Takaful is also very uh, important in in uh, meeting the, the health related financing. The third paper was about Islamic banking after COVID-19. It was discussed that uh, risk management is very important for Islamic banks, especially because even in the best of times, the liquidity management is quite difficult for Islamic banks. And now when the crisis happens, the markets are stalled and then uh, the liquidity management becomes uh, more critical for Islamic banking. But then there are positives. Asset backed financing versus unsecured loans is a is a positive in Islamic banking when it comes to risk management. But there are constraints in product offering when it comes to distress financing. So we have products when the firms are looking for expansion. But when the firms are looking for uh, distress financing, we have limited products and those products also have uh, different, um, uh, uh, you can say, outlook by the scholars in the industry. The last paper was on Islamic social finance. We all know it is very important. One suggestion is that um, if you uh, map the SDGs with the Islamic finance institutions and instruments, that would give a holistic picture in one uh, slide, in one table, 
that uh, how the SDGs are quite uh, uh, congruent and constant, uh, uh, are compatible with the, with the, the Islamic finance instruments and in institutions, and what Islamic finance instruments and in institutions can uh, can uh, help in achieving those SDGs. So if you have a one-on-one -on -one map with the SDGs with Islamic finance institutions and instruments in a table, uh, that would be a very good way to uh, present. You have uh, rightly said that there's compatibility between uh, SDGs, ESGs, green finance, socially responsible investment, and the, the, the philosophy and, and the institutions of Islamic finance. So due to the shortage of time, I, um, I would end here. Uh, Back to Dr. Salim Sab.